Do you ever stop to wonder of all the worlds that humans could have created? How did we end up with this one? This land of barbed wire, these cities of rubble, the deep political divides and deeper personal pain. The answer in short is violence. Violence that rips apart lives and communities, leaving suffering in its wake. Violence is a choice, and choices are not destiny. We are a search for common ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. Over a thousand people spread across four continents, working on the front lines of violent conflict to turn suspicion and fear into community. We start with the truth, but common ground is not the middle. It does not ask you to compromise your values or shed your beliefs. Common ground means meeting someone where they are, understanding the deep fears and hopes that drive them, and shifting people so that they are seated on the same side of the table, facing a shared problem together, not as enemies. From Yemen to the US, we use common ground to mend what is broken, finding creative ways to reach millions of people, shifting attitudes and then institutions so that change lasts. We are peace builders, staring violence in the face, standing without fear, bold in our dreams, bolder in our action, leaders who listen, listeners who lead. This is the future that we are building so that one day we can ask of all the worlds that humans could have created, how did we end up with this one? Hello and welcome. I am Isam Ghanim, the president of Search for Common Ground. I'm so pleased to have you join us today as we celebrate our 39th birthday of an organization that I'm very proud to be part of and I'm very proud to represent today uh, for you. Across four decades, um, we have worked on the front lines um, of violent conflicts in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and we learned major lessons that we'd like to share with you. And as we are sharing these lessons, we would like also to show how these lessons could be used in order to address the crisis of today. Since 1982, the world has come together in a profound way. We have digital tools, uh, people are connected almost all the time, um, there is economic progress, even if it is with inequality. Um, and, uh, but on the other angle, when you look at the world, it, sometimes you feel that as if it is falling apart. Um, violence is uh, spilling over borders. Um, extremism is on the rise. Um, and the divisions that divide people rather than bring them together um, I think are becoming more um, obvious uh, from day to day. Um, search is founded on a very basic, uh, simple concept. Uh, people disagree all the time. Conflicts um, is and differences are inevitable. However, violence is a choice. Um, and one of our important impact um, uh, is to really uh, enable people to avoid making that choice of resorting to conflicts. Our mission is simple. We transform the, how the world deal with conflicts from adversarial approaches to those of collaboration. And we enable people to build trust and agree on how they can really go um, uh, you know, on with their lives and, and livelihoods. Over 39 years, uh, Serge had grown to become uh, the largest 
dedicated peace building organization. We have about 1,000 staff spread across all the continents, working with thousands of partners. 90% uh, of our staff are from the countries where we work. They are local. This is not a coincidence, but it is based on our belief that knowledge and wisdom always exist in, within these communities. And, and, and if we enable them to build trust and, uh, you know, and, and manage dialogue, um, they can really agree on peace uh, and, and build peace while their differences could remain intact. Um, I'm very proud and happy um, to share with you today some examples about how we deal with some of these uh, conflicts and problems. But I would like to say that personally, I spent over 30 years um, of my life um, on the front line of violent conflicts around the world. And I have seen and witnessed, and I'm sure some of you uh, do, how spectacular progress um, in development, economically, socially, culturally, could be wiped out within just days of eruption of, uh, of a violent conflict. And therefore, I do believe that peace building is a prerequisite for development, as well as it is an insurance uh, for sustaining the gain of uh, development effort and the investment on development, uh, you know, generally. I'm very happy to present to you examples of this work, um, and I'm very delighted to uh, introduce to you um, my colleague, Kemi um, Olefiago, who will uh, give you uh, an example from Nigeria um, about the, the Niger girls and how they were able to walk across these dividing lines. Thank you, Isan. My name is Kemi Lofayoku, and I'm the Central and East Africa Program Officer here at Search for Common Ground. Throughout tonight's program, you'll see a QR code like the one pop up on the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to make a donation to support frontline peace building around the world, simply open your camera on your phone and point it towards the code. We're so incredibly grateful for the generous contributions of our global supporters and know that this support is what makes our work possible. When peace building succeeds, it transforms whole societies, moving communities from division to health and challenging injustice. But peace building always starts in the most intimate and personal way, with powerful relationships. This is why the person is the smallest unit of change, and why peace building is something that each of us can choose to pursue in our everyday lives. In 2017, when we started the Niger Girls program, Plateau State in Nigeria was an incredibly difficult place to forge relationships. With deep-seated divides between Christians and Muslim communities, many Christians grew up without having a single Muslim friend, and vice versa. In 2018, 86 people were killed in a single day of violence in the city of Jos, with thousands fleeing from their homes. This was the latest episode in a long history of religious violence and intolerance. For the Niger Girl program, our approach was to run youth camps for girls between the ages of 12 through 16 so they could meet peers across religious divides and learn the necessary collaborative skills to find commonality, collectively problem solve, and transform their communities. In the beginning, it was pretty tough. Miriam, a Muslim participant, remembers dropping her Quran on the very first day of the camp and having a Christian girl pick it up. Miriam didn't even turn back to acknowledge her. The Niger Girl participants came into the program with deep fears, rooted in sentiments of mistrust, sown through years of intolerance. Niger Girls gained momentum as participants began to work together towards joint goals, including 25 community projects and a 26-episode television program entitled Voices of the Youth. Mariam and Mercy, the girl who retrieved her Quran, became close friends, and by the end of the project, many participants started their very own peace and anti-bullying clubs in their communities. Among other lessons, Niger Girls reveals a critical yet overlooked point about peace building. Common ground is not the middle. Christian girls and Muslim girls entered Niger Girls with huge differences in their beliefs and culture. And by the end of the program, those differences and beliefs remained intact. 
and asking participants to find common ground. We are not pushing them to compromise their values. We are asking them to dig beneath the surface, find their shared humanity, and act on that foundation. After Niger Girls, many young participants returned to their neighborhoods to give speeches, directly reaching over 3,500 Christians and Muslims. Separately, Miriam and Mercy attended community meetings and spoke in front of crowds of adults, many of whom still held painful memories of the violence of 2018. In one of the most divided cities in Nigeria, a country with over 250 ethnic groups and over 500 spoken languages, we have created a generation of young women ready to lead their communities away from adversarial practices and towards collaborative solutions. And everything starts with personal trust. Peace building starts with personal relationships, but leads to systemic change. Healthy relationships, like the ones grown by Niger girls, are the foundations of peace building. Search for Common Ground works to build trust and then shift systems so that collaboration is expected and incentivized. Through First Year Connect, we are working to make inclusive dialogue a cornerstone of college campuses in the United States. College campuses have increasingly been contending with an erosion of social cohesion and an increase in divisiveness and polarization, microcosms really, of the dynamics we see in the country as a whole. Ideally, college is a formative experience where people live in diverse communities that enrich their learning and growth. In reality, many campuses report silos, an entrenchment of toxic narratives, and more recently, even a sharp increase in hate crimes. How young people interact on campuses is an indicator of how they will civically conduct themselves in the broader world, which means building campus cultures that welcome healthy discourse, foster dialogue across lines of difference, and nourish civic engagement is vital. So First Year Connect started with a question. What if there were a structured, safe space for students to discuss their differences in a way that builds trust, not erodes it? First Year Connect, a collaboration between Search for Common Ground and Solia, is designed based on Solia's flagship international virtual exchange program. Built as a learning by doing experience aimed at fostering empathy, critical thinking, and constructive engagement across lines of difference. The program aims to build, bring all incoming first year students together in facilitated dialogue. Groups of eight to 12 students deliberately mixed across expected lines of divide come together over a period of four weeks using video conferencing technology to journey through a deep dialogue process. They build trust, learn skills of constructive dialogue, and prepare to use these skills across their digital and personal communities. In its pilot year, First Year Connect faced a trial by fire with heated racial and political deb debates across the US. While we felt confident about the design of the program based on 17 years of conducting such programming globally, we did not anticipate the environment during which we would end up launching the program. The first round of dialogue happened in the summer, soon after the murder of Mr. George Floyd, while the second round happened in the winter, concurrent with the January 6th events at the Capitol. So First Year Connect successfully brought 500 students together in provocative dialogue during this time equipping them to continue seeking engagement rather than othering or siloing. Through First Year Connect, we also trained faculty and alumni from the campus communities in online dialogue facilitation to deepen the sustainability of the program across the campus ecosystem. Participants, faculty and facilitators all reported that having a safe space in which to conduct potentially difficult conversations was very valuable particularly during this historical chapter. First Year Connect transformed attitudes. At a time when disinformation, competing narratives seem so rampant, being able to engage with peers whose opinions vastly diverged provided rich learning. It allowed them to humanize each other. Three out of four students said that First Year Connect helped them to build their active listening skills. And roughly the same number said First Year Connect helped them to build meaningful relationships with their peers. In the words of an administrator at SUNY Potsdam, one of our partner campuses, 
quote, at this current moment in time, if we do anything for our students here at Potsdam, it should be First Year Connect. First Year Connect can transform campuses into thriving communities where students are equipped and activated to engage constructively across dividing lines. In this spring semester, a popular Potsdam professor decided to engage students in a hard conversation around the January 6th Capitol event. But when he opened the discussion, the Zoom call went silent, people turned off their cameras, they disengaged, and they weren't able to have this conversation. In the next class, he asked students if they thought there would be a better way to hold this discussion. He explained what had happened in the first section of the class and invited ideas from this class. And one of the students said, why not use the first year connect approach? Create ownership of the process, let us set up the ground rules, let's break up into smaller groups and then come back once we've settled into the discussion. They tried it and it resulted in a full, healthy discussion. This is a powerful illustration of the students carrying their learning further out from the program into the broader campus environment and then ideally even beyond. First Year Connect enables this kind of powerful change, which lies at the core of all peace building programs. The change from fear to curiosity, a willingness to tackle differences with a view to pursue common goals. What makes Search for Common Ground unique, even among peace building organizations, is our ability to link community action with national level change. One of our strongest examples comes from Tunisia, where we use the hit TV show called I'm the President to build democratic norms and inspire future leaders. Peace building starts with personal transformation as you saw with Niger girls, and it ends by shifting society as a whole. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, a pro-democracy movement that swept the region, but fell short of many hopes, including in Tunisia, the birthplace of the Arab Spring. When we launched I'm the President, 90% of Tunisians named government corruption as a major issue and ISIS was recruiting more people per capita in Tunisia than anywhere else. Many young people felt excluded, with voters turnout under 12% for people younger than 25. We launched I'm the President to increase civic engagement and help young people to envision a better democracy. I'm the President was modeled of a similar show that we had run in Palestine with contestants competing on, uh, on screen to win a fictional election. In Tunisia, I'm the president, uh, was, uh, in Tunisia, I'm the president gained a high profile, a high profile right away with over 2,000 young people submitting an application and search for common ground, partnering with the Monadara Initiative the official organizer of Tunisia's real presidential debate. From the start, we were focused on creating a safe space where young Tunisians could gain political skills, practice dialogue, and represent Persian local issues. The show started when we invited 100 candidates to spend 10 days at the presidential academy where they would meet with top officials, including government ministers and local authorities to learn about human rights legislation and more, with contestants representing different genders, socioeconomic classes and regions of Tunisia. We strove to create an environment where everyone could flourish. One female contestant was young mother, and we welcomed her husband into the Presidential Academy. Ultimately, the show narrowed to 24 finalists who debated each other and responded to mock national crisis as they vied to become the president. 1.1 million people turned in, uh, in for our final episode 
with 83% of viewers agreeing that merely watching the, the show increased their knowledge of the political process. I'm the president, coincided with an actual presidential election in Tunisia, and our show was broadcast on, alongside presidential debates. As Mehdi Jama, the former prime minister of Tunisia, said, the timing of the initiative is perfect. It will help the audience to understand complicated laws in an easy way. Moreover, I'm the president, forget strong relationships between contestants, creating a national network of young people that lasted beyond the program. One contestant returned home to become mayor of their district. Another was elected vice president of their municipal council. And the third joined a different TV show to give more political commentary. After the show, the 100 contestants spread out across Tunisia, launching projects to respond to COVID-19 and increase access to education. But the deepest legacy of I'm the president is renewed enthusiasm of, for young people as political actors and community leaders in Tunisia. With roughly 10% of Tunisia watching the show, I'm the president helped viewers to find hope, recognize their own strengths, and see themselves as proactive democratic citizens. More than anything, we are proud of how we have seeded uh, peace-building values of collaboration, determination, and hope in Tunisian culture. Thank you, Iman Bilhadi, for telling us the story uh, of I Am the President. Uh, I remember when I was with you in Tunisia, and we experience the importance of youth in any movement and that engaging youth um, cannot be um, you know, overlooked or understated. Thank you. I also want to thank our guests here tonight for sending me your messages and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to support Search for Common Ground and to be partners in pursuing that noble mission. I know I'm speaking on behalf of all of our staff around the globe when I say thank you so much for believing in SIRS and for supporting peace building at the mission. We could not do it without you and we need you. It's a pleasure to welcome our last speaker to the stage, um, my colleague and friend, the CEO of SIRS for Common Ground, Shamil Idris. Um, Shamil spent almost all of his professional life uh, promoting peace um, ag around the globe. Um, and um, I'm sure he will be excited and, and, and we are all honored to listen to his perspectives and examples. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us on this 39th anniversary of Search for Common Ground's founding. My workday today started very early uh, in the morning with pictures and videos and texts from colleagues in Nigeria, Macedonia, Lebanon, Brussels, and elsewhere, all celebrating our organizational birthday. So I'm really pleased to end my work evening with you marking the same occasion. Uh, we have with us friends, supporters, and colleagues from Indonesia to Indiana, from London to Luanda, uh, among you, we've got people who uh, try to make every event that we hold. We have others who are new to the organization. Uh, we even have some old friends who we haven't seen for a decade or more. So I want to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. But our presence here together across all of this diversity begs the question, why uh, are we all interested in this term common ground at this time? Personally, I've spent 30 years in peace building from being trained as a mediator, uh, as a college student, to volunteering in U.S. prisons between joining, before joining Search for Common Ground. My wife is an expert on violent extremism here in the U.S. We were both appalled uh, to witness the, the storming of the U.S. Capitol by thousands of Americans just a few miles from where I'm sitting now 
just a couple months ago. And since that day, I've heard Common Ground called for and also critiqued more than perhaps at any other time in the 39 year history of our organization. I think Common Ground captures our attention because we feel it eroding underneath our feet. We find it harder to find even with some close family members. And we notice it is disturbingly absent from our social media feeds. So allow me to close this evening by sharing with you where I think we are and where we need to go in terms of common ground. And I'll start by acknowledging a, a hard truth. The logic of violence is gaining. That logic rests on a mindset that the only way for me to get what is important to me is to deny you what is important to you. We can see the result of this kind of win-lose thinking here in the US, not just in the events of January 6, but in the record high numbers, nearly 50% of American Republicans and Democrats who see each other as a threat to the nation. We see the result of this win-lose thinking in the words of the UN Secretary General, who said that the pandemic is a clear test of international cooperation and one that we have essentially failed. The failure he's talking about is not merely political, but human and deeply personal. There's not a person on this call who hasn't been affected by the pandemic over this last year. And yet there are people here who won't have access to a vaccine for two or more years, while there are others among us who got our vaccines weeks ago. You see the result of this win-lose thinking in the countries where we work, from Myanmar, where peaceful protesters are facing down violent, a violent crackdown, in Yemen, where a decade-long war continues to rage, and in Nigeria, where extremist groups are using mass child abduction as a political tool. The logic of violence is gaining, and it's affecting us all. So where do we go from here? We have to be much bolder, more visible, even louder, because we know what works. Search for Common Ground was established 39 years ago today, and since then we have applied and improved a methodology for turning conflict into cooperation, the common ground approach. And we've logged some impressive wins along the way, some of which you heard about uh, in the last half an hour. In fact, just yesterday, I was talking to the newly appointed president of the US Institute of Peace, somebody who over decades has seen our work firsthand across particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, including in her most recent position as the head of the UN's humanitarian and development operations in Yemen. And she said to me, you know, the amazing thing about search is that you're able to mobilize a demand for peace from such a large and divided community that many others don't even dare to try. But notwithstanding these wins, across our first 39 years, we also have not been very vocal about what we have learned. In short, we've let others define what common ground is, and we're not happy with the result. In this dark moment, with the logic of violence gaining, we see a new and historic opportunity to make what we know visible and to bring it to bear even more powerfully, including right here where I'm sitting in the United States. And this is what we know. You don't find common ground by seeking the midpoint between two extremes. You don't find common ground by asking people to abandon their principles in favor of accommodating people who hate them or hurt them. And you don't find it by ignoring the grievances and the insecurities that give rise to conflict in the first place. On the contrary, recent years have brought the eruption of major social movements, democratic revolutions in nearly every region of the world, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. Each movement dredges up deep grievances and brings harsh questions to light. At search, we know that such moments of conflict are not only inevitable, but they are natural and in fact good. Because in every conflict, there is a signal that something in the system is broken. And on the other side of that conflict is a world that works better for all of us, provided we have the courage to build it together. The common ground approach seizes that opportunity. It begins, it gains momentum, and it succeeds ultimately by building trust. Just as oxygen sustains human life, trust sustains healthy communities. If you're focused on solving a problem or advocating for a policy, but not building the underlying trust that can sustain them, then the results you produce will not last. The power of the common ground approach 
is that it works both for complex conflicts, the ones involving warring tribes and nations, but also for more intimate conflicts, the kind that you and I live in our daily lives. So how does the common ground approach build trust? Step one, listen deeply. We live at a time when everyone is talking and hardly anyone is listening. YouTube's motto, broadcast yourself, is perhaps the perfect motto for this age. Around the world, deep listening enables our teams to recognize the underlying interests, fears, and aspirations that are informing people's positions. Listening also relaxes and softens people who have become accustomed and resentful to being ignored or misunderstood. In short, deep listening prepares everyone for step two, which is to identify a common purpose. If you skip step one, if you try to imagine some commonality between yourself and the uncle whose views drive you crazy or the policy advocate whose position you can't stand, you'll fail. Common problems and common goals come into view when we dig beneath the, the campaign hashtags to understand what is really driving and motivating people. And that's where we find the potential both to solve a shared problem and to build the underlying trust. But we can only capitalize on that potential if we take step three, which is to act together. Nothing builds trust like shared success. When Kemi spoke about Nigerian teenagers who transformed the way their Christian and Muslim communities related to one another, when Wade, he talked about how US college students, black, white, liberal, conservative, modeled how to have a constructive conversation in one of the most divisive moments in this country's history. When the president of the US Institute of Peace marveled at our ability to manage huge and diverse coalitions, even in the wake of war. Every one of these examples reflects what happens when people listen deeply, identify a shared purpose, and then act together on it. What emerges are healthy relationships and communities that are safer, happier, and much better able to deal with the inevitable conflicts of tomorrow and the next day. And this is the final lesson we've learned about common ground. It's less a destination than it is the pathway. Starting with this 39th birthday, we intend to be much more visible and assertive about what common ground is and is not. We've launched a campaign to amplify the lessons from our frontline peace builders. For the last 39 years, whenever we've heard the call for common ground from communities in crisis, we've sought to answer that call. In the process, we've helped deeply divided people learn to, to live with their differences, find common ground, and build a shared future free from violence. And today we're hearing that call more than ever, including daily here in the US. And this summer we will be answering that call and launching a new program on US Independence Day, July 4th. So please watch this space. You know, I, as I close this event, I wanna reflect for you that I, I've been involved with this organization for more than half my life. And our mission has never felt more pressing or more personal. All of us that you heard from today, Isam, Kemi, Wadehi, Iman, and over a thousand other Search for Common Ground colleagues who you didn't hear from today, but are reflected in the remarks and the results that we shared with you. All of us are on this common ground pathway. You should join us. Celebrate our 39th birthday by helping us seize this moment. Please consider giving $39 or $390 or $3.9 million if you've got it. Uh, this is the final year of a matching commitment from a very generous board member who's with us right now. So any dollar you give will be doubled. On the bottom of your screen is a QR code as well as a link to the donation uh, page of our website. Please contribute and stay on this pathway with Search for Common Ground to a future that will be better for all of us. Thank you so much for joining.
Thank you.